We're going to have an interesting conversation today with Andrew Roberts, who has written what I think many people would say, and I would say is the best one volume uh, biography of, of Winston Churchill. How many people here admire Winston Churchill? Any <laughs> <laughs> How many people think we, we have a lot of Winston Churchills in our public life today? <laughs> okay, well, maybe hope springs eternal. Maybe someday there'll be another one. So uh, Andrew Roberts is a very distinguished scholar. He is a graduate of Cambridge. His PhD is from Cambridge as well. Uh, he is an honorary scholar there now. He's also um, a scholar at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He's written 15 books. Uh, many of them on uh, leaders in Europe, such as Napoleon and Wellington. And this particular book on Churchill is a book that's got an enormous amount of attention, bestseller, and we'll talk about how he actually spent the time to do it and why he did it. So why don't we just dig into, um, the world already has a fair number of Churchill books. Did the world need one more Churchill book? Why did you think the world did need one more Churchill book? <laughs> um. I wonder if I might preface my remarks by congratulating you on the National Book Festival you. and what uh, you've done. Uh, well, okay. So, um, and then to, um, to answer your question, yes, there are 1,009 biographies of Winston Churchill. And so in order to write the 1,010th, you have to have what my uh, wife calls unutterable hubris. Um, but... Uh, what also has happened in the last six to eight years is that there has been a avalanche of new sources on Winston Churchill. Um, Her Majesty the Queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use her father's diaries. And King George VI, who met uh, Churchill every day, every Tuesday, sorry, of the Second World War, wrote down everything that Churchill said. So that's a wonderful new source, which tells us what's in the King's, um, what's in Churchill's mind every Tuesday of the war. And then there's been 51 sets of papers that have been deposited at Churchill College, Cambridge, in uh, the archives there in Cambridge, uh, since the last major biography of Churchill. There has been the diaries of Ivan Maisky, the Soviet ambassador, 1932 to 43, which have also been published in Moscow in the last four years. And uh, about eight years ago, I discovered the, the uh, verbatim accounts of the War Cabinet. And that, too, now allows us to know what everybody was saying in the War Cabinet. So there are these and other things. Um, uh, the, the Churchill family very generously allowed me to have exclusive access to Pamela Harriman's love letters. And Pamela Harriman led a very uh, active love life uh, during the Second World she War. She was married to Winston Churchill's son, is that right? She was married and had a baby but to um, right. Winston Churchill's son during the war, but she also had an affair with Avril Harriman, very famously, who she, uh, FDR's envoy, who she later married. And also with Jock Whitney, and Ed Murrow, the, um, the journalist, um, and uh, Marshal of the Air Force, Sir Charles Portal, and General Kenneth, General, <laughs> that was how it was, uh, General Kenneth Anderson, uh, and someone we just know of as Jerry. Um, okay. They're just the people in the, from the Second World War that we know of. Um, although I had exclusive access to her papers, clearly nobody had exclusive access to her. Um, <laughs> And uh, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but what we get is, uh, is therefore a new picture of Churchill from all of these new sources. All right, so the family, uh, you went to the family and said, would you cooperate and give me this, or did they call you? Um, I called them again and again. And they said, okay. Ultimately. All right, and um, um, how long did it take to, to go through all the materials that you have and all the other existing materials? Does that take a month or two of research? Four years of research. Four years. Four so years. For four years, you're just researching. Yes. And, and uh, this, is, this is the fifth book that I've written with Churchill in the title or the subtitle, so, and over 30 years. So I very much sort of felt that I, I'd got the basis of it in my mind anyhow. So, well, so when you're doing a four years of research, I mean, I know from my own research, you know, I write notes, I lose them, and so forth. So how do you, uh, what is your system to keep the notes and catalog everything and make sure you, you can recall it when you go to write? Well, you do uh, two things, really. First of all, you knock out a 
timeline that takes um, from the day he's born to the day he dies and what he was doing in every, on every um, important occasion. And sometimes each hour of, of very important moments, like in the early part of the Second World War. And the second thing you do is to um, make, in my case, I think it was like 300 or 400 even files of Churchill's uh, connections with different things. Okay. Um, and then you work out how to slip the... Um, the issues file into the overall timeline. When you, when you do this research, you do it by yourself? You have a researcher? I've never once employ, employed a researcher in my life. Okay, and you put everything on a computer in the end? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, and so how long does it take to write this after you do four years of research? I wrote that book in 100 days. 100 days? Yeah. Uh, I was writing 5,000 um, words a day. And it took me, yes, three months and, and ten days. So do you just sit by a computer or typewriter and write it out? I do, usually in my dressing gown and slippers. Um, and uh, when I, get, I start at four o'clock in the morning and I go through until lunchtime. And then at lunchtime, when I'm feeling uh, a little tired, I drink a can of um, Red Bull, the... Uh, <laughs> The, the coffee, caffeine drink, which is not good, by the way, for you to drink 100 cans of Red Bull over uh, 100 days. I'm, I'm certain it isn't. Uh, certainly not very good for my weight, but it keeps you, um, it keeps you buzzing like this for, uh, uh, for the necessary hours so to work. So what you write into what time? I'll write, and oh, not, not uh, late, until uh, about um, 9 o'clock at night. And then I go straight to bed and start again and at 4 o'clock. And then would you rewrite the next day, or you just, this is it? I don't do any rewriting until the very end. And then I, I uh, go through it twice, and then hand it on to the publisher. Okay, so after doing four years of research, and previously you'd written about him before, after this book was completed, do you admire him more than you did before, or you admire him less than you did before? More, in fact, and I admired him quite a lot before um, I, uh, I wrote it. It's, it. it's an interesting thing sometimes with uh, people that you write about. Sometimes you wind up hating them, despising them. The more you know about them, the more you see their clay feet and, uh, and the more you just can't bear being with them any longer. With Churchill, I felt a, a real sadness when I had to um, give up because you only have to wait two or three pages in uh, his speeches to find some brilliant aperçu or some wonderful phrase or some joke that makes you want to read on. So why do you think it is that probably of all uh, non-royals, he's the most popular uh, British figure in modern times? And is that still the case? Um, well, unfortunately, it, it's the case from people who know about him, but unfortunately, uh, there's extraordinary ignorance about, um, about Churchill. 20% of British teenagers think that he was a fictional character, um, which is a nerve-wracking thing, really. But though, of the people who know who he was, he is, um, he is tremendously popular. So why is he so popular in the United States, do you think? Um, well, I think uh, it helps that he was a part American, of course. It helps his mother was American. His mother w was born in Brooklyn. Um, that he was a, um, somebody who liked Americans, got on with them, appreciated, of course, the vital importance of, um, of uh, being allied to the Roosevelt administration during the war, because he made so many comments and phrases and quotations that uh, are good for you. Uh, in life, you know, things that, that, that uh, you can live your life by. And, of course, he helped defeat fascism. Now, this book has been on the bestseller list for a long time, and uh, it's a very long book. So do you think that, were you surprised that a book of about a 1,000 pages or so would make the bestseller list? I was surprised, actually. My, my publishers kept telling me to make it shorter, um, and I have, in fact, made it shorter. It was originally 60,000 words longer uh, than it is, but they kept saying that the glue wouldn't work on the spine um, and that pages would keep falling out. And so I cut 60,000 words, which was like chopping off my own fingernails. Sorry, fingers. And, um, it, uh, and it finally fitted into that. It could have been, David, it could have been 10 times longer. It the, the amount of, um, of uh, concision, constant concision one has to use uh, with Churchill because he wrote 37 books and 800 articles. So the most surprising thing that you learned in your research and that you wrote about is what? 
uh, which is something I got from the King's Diaries, in fact, was the extraordinary um, level of frustration that Churchill felt that the United States was moving slow, so slowly towards um, getting into the Second World War. He understood emotionally and intellectually, of course, um, that there was an enormous America First movement, um, Charles Lindbergh and all of that were keeping uh, America isolated. But he still also felt that the greatest democracy should have done more earlier to have um, tried to destroy fascism. Now, he has um, known the United States and around the world for his very good wit and for his good writing style. He obviously won the Nobel Prize for Literature. But um, was all the wit and all the funny statements he used to make, were they prepared in advance, or was his wit that quick he could just come up with them? And what is your single favorite Churchill story? <laughs> uh, his wit was incredibly fast, yes. He had that, um, uh, that capacity like um, Noel Coward or Groucho Marx and, and, and various other people to be able to give a, uh, a brilliant reply. Uh, my favourite one at the moment, I've got two favourite ones. Can I am I allowed two? Oh, yes. OK, my favourite one at the moment, and there are about 200 Churchill jokes in this book. Um, and, uh, but the one I particularly like at the moment, and this is going to be good, I think, to a literary audience like the uh, Washington Book Festival, was when his, his, uh, his, his private secretary, Jock Colville, came to him and said that their cook had been made pregnant as the result of a nocturnal assignation with a man in the street in Verona. And uh, Churchill replied, obviously not one of the two gentlemen. <laughs> oh, and the other one, sorry, the other one were, uh, was when um, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister, of course, but at that time German ambassador to London, came up to Churchill at a reception and um, threatened him and said that in the next war, Italy will be on the side of the Third Reich. And Churchill immediately replied, well, it seems only fair. We had to have them last time. <laughs> I'll give you one of my Churchill stories. <laughs> he, after he's finished his second term as prime minister, he comes to Virginia. He goes to Bri Richmond. He's being toured around for a dinner by a, uh, a leading lady in the uh, Richmond Society. And she says, can I get you dinner, Win uh, Sir Winston? He says, yes. And he said, she said, what would you like? He said, well, I'd like some of that chicken breast. She says, well, in mixed company, we don't use the word breast. Uh, it's white meat. He said, okay, can I have some of that white meat? Okay. Next day he leaves, sends her a telegram. Thank you very much for the hospitality. Uh, please take this corsage and put it over your white meat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. so um, let's go through his life. So he's born to privilege, is that right? Very much. He's born in uh, Blenheim Palace, which is um, the greatest and grandest palace in the, in the United Kingdom, and he's the grandson of a duke. Okay. Even the royals are envious of Bel Blenheim Palace. So uh, does he grow up as a child with a great scholarly record? Is he a great uh, athlete? What is his strength as a child? Um, yes, he is a sportsman. He won the um, fencing, the public school fencing competition, later went on to be a, a very successful polo player. So he was fit, young, uh, healthy lad, um, which one doesn't always think of him when one sees the big right. pictures of him being uh, sort of, you know, large in, in later life. He was very fit as a young man. Um, and um, he wasn't anything like so dim as he made himself out to be in his autobiography, My Early Life, uh, where he said he couldn't do Latin and Greek. In fact, when you go to the archives and see his school reports, he was in the top third of all his classes, including in, uh, in Latin. And it's very rare for a politician to try to make himself to be more ignorant and dim than he genuinely is. Uh, but this is what Churchill did. So. Did he go to Oxford or Cambridge? Neither. He went to uh, Sandhurst, and, uh, which is our, our military academy, and uh, he excelled as a horseman and did very well there. Um, but he, he educated himself entirely by reading all the great books of the Western canon when he was in the army. So he graduated, and then he went into the military directly? Yes, yes. After Sandhurst, he, uh, he went off to the northwest frontier of India to, to fight one of the border wars. That and was he had. in the Boer Wars? 
fighting the army. He was in the Boer War. He, before that, he was in the Su Sudan, uh, the war in the Sudan. He managed to actually um, fight in four campaigns on three continents in the first five years that he was in the army. Um, amazing. Uh, now, amazing was he act. captured ever as a prisoner? He was, yes. After uh, the Boers, um, the South African um, Afrikaans, uh, captured his train, the armoured train that he was on. He then was, um, he was captured after two months, he managed to um, escape and he crossed 300 miles of enemy territory. At one point he had to hide down a mine shaft and when the candle guttered out, uh, he felt rats climbing over his face uh, down in the bottom of the mine shaft. But he managed to get back to uh, British territory and, uh, and was an international hero after that. That he abandons the military and goes into journalism, is that right? No, he was a journalist at the same time that he was a soldier. Rather strangely, he was able to write, um, to write as a journalist. He became the best paid war correspondent in the world at the time. While he, while he is in the military, he's also a journalist. Yes, exactly. Okay, so when does he decide to run for the parliament? Um, well, he'd already won, run once for Parliament before he went out he to lost. fight in the... But he lost his seat the first time he fought. And this was very fortunate because, of course, it allowed him then to become a, a war hero as well as a uh, war correspondent in the Boer War. But then when he came back after that, he stood in, for the same seat and won it. As a Conservative? As a Conservative. All right, so does he rise up in the Parliament as a member of the Conservative Party? No, he's still a backbencher. His father had been Chancellor of the Exchequer and a very senior Conservative, one of the great uh, uh, Victorian politicians of the era. But he is still a backbencher when he left the Conservative Party and crossed over the floor of the House. Okay, and when does he become First Lord of the Admiralty? Um, not until 1911, which is seven years after he's crossed over the floor of the House. Before that, he was um, brought into the Liberal... Having joined the Liberal Party, only two years later, he was brought into the Liberal government. And, um, and then he rose up to be Home Secretary, and then after that, uh, First Lord. Right. As the First Lord of the Admiralty in the United States, I guess that would be like Secretary of the Navy, in effect. Um, he, in World War I, he designs a plan under which the British are going to attack the soft underbelly of the, uh, of the Germans uh, and the uh, <coughs> opposition axis. Um, does that plan work? No, um, it, was a, it was a catastrophic disaster. And um, the idea was to try to knock the Ottoman Empire out of the, out of the war. Uh, they were the junior partner of uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. And his plan, which was a brilliant one in, in so many ways, to try to get a fleet up into the... Um, off Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, and force the Ottoman Empire out of the war, um, fell on the execution of the plan, which Churchill wasn't responsible for, but nonetheless, uh, he, and he wasn't there, but nonetheless, it was a disaster. And then he doubled down on the defeat um, terribly in the Gallipoli campaign in an attempt to, to try to uh, ultimately turn the whole process there. And ultimately, 147,000 people were killed or wounded. In that, uh, so in that campaign. So is he forced out as the First Lord of the Admiralty? Yes, he was forced to resign and he decided, even though he wasn't, he didn't need to because of his age, uh, to go and fight in the trenches of the First World War on the Western Front. So he was a member of the Parliament, a member of the Cabinet, and he goes in as a trench soldier. He right? resigned, he was a member of Parliament, but he'd resigned from the Cabinet uh, okay. over the, over the okay. Gallipoli ca catastrophe. But he decided that he was going to go in. It's a redemptive thing, you know, to, uh, to decide that he was going to, um, to share the dangers of his men. He became a Lieutenant Colonel of the 6th Battalion of the Royal Scots Fusiliers, and he was on the front line constantly. He went into the no man's land no fewer than 30 times. Did he come close to getting shot at? Every day, um, and, uh, and lots of people around him were, um, right. were killed. He once said that there's nothing more exhilarating in life than to be shot at without result. <laughs> so he ultimately goes back into the parliament, is that right? Or he was yes. already in the parliament, but he goes back... Um, 
sort of redeemed. After his um, regiment was, his battalion was amalgamated with another battalion and somebody else more senior than him took over his regiment. Uh, therefore, you know, nothing to do with him as it were. Uh, he went back into the House of Commons and um, criticised the great, he did two things. Firstly, he, he had already supported the concept of the tank. Uh, he was very much the person who put the money behind the creation of the tank, hoping that it was going to be able to, uh, to defeat the trench warfare. And he, so he supported that when he got back into Parliament. And he also uh, criticised the um, appalling losses in the Battle of the Somme and, uh, and others of those massive offences. What party the is he Front. in the Parliament? Liberal. Still in, the, still in the Liberal Party. Now, he then switches again to the Conservative Party? Yes, but that's, um, that's not until 1922, okay. 23, when he, um, uh, he'd left the Conservative Party in 1904 because of free trade. He believed in free trade. And when the, the Conservative Party dumped the concept of free trade and adopted protectionism, he left the Conservative Party. But when the Conservative Party went back to free trade, he then went back, and he had a marvellous line about that, which was that um, anyone can rat, but it takes a certain ingenuity to re-rat. <laughs> what did he think of tariffs? Um, he was against them. He was against Tarrant. Very much, yeah. Okay, so um, he rises up again, and um, among the things he does when he's in Parliament is he's uh, very um, against uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Is that right? And yes, yes, absolutely. He was an imperialist. He believed in, in Britain's um, role in India. And so does he uh, focus on kind of putting Mahatma Gandhi down and the protests down? Um, yeah, very much, yes. He, he uh, was rude about Mahatma Gandhi. He, uh, some of his more caustic comments were, were made about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, he called him a half-naked fakir, who, striding up the, um, the steps of the Viceregal Lodge in order to speak to the, uh, to the um, Viceroy of India, uh, which he didn't think that he should do because he believed that Gandhi only spoke for the um, for the Hindu uh, Hindus there and had no interest in the untouchables or the Muslims okay. or the princes. Now he also is uh, close to some members of the royal family so King Edward um, is going to maybe uh, marry an American woman who was twice divorced um, he supports King Edward? Um, in a sense, I mean, he, he knew and liked um, uh, the king as, uh, as a friend for many years. He didn't think that Mrs. Simpson um, needed to be officially Queen of England. He thought that it was perfectly possible that they could go down the European route and have what's called a Morganatic marriage, whereby uh, you're married um, perfectly legally, but the, you don't, your wife doesn't take the ra same rank and status as you. And it's something that, uh, to all intents and purposes, we have at the moment, because the, um, uh, the Prince of Wales' wife is not the Princess of Wales. She's the Duchess of Cornwall. So it's something that was a bit before its time. Now he also is against the German uh, armament that he sees, rearmament, and he says that the British are not being uh, strong enough in rearming itself. Yes, he's the first person, and for many years the only person, to actually um, see what Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were all about. The, the, I mean, by person, I mean senior British politician. And he spotted Hitler and the Nazis early, and he warned against uh, the, um, uh, allowing them to get away with what they were trying to do in Europe, and he was in favour of uh, rearming, uh, especially in the air, of course. So well, ultimately, when uh, the war breaks out in Europe, he's made the uh, first order of the Admiralty again? That's right. Because he'd been proved right about Hitler um, and the Nazis, and everybody else had got it wrong, uh, finally, on the 3rd of September 1939, the day the Second World War broke out, um, Churchill was, made, was given his old job back of First Lord of the Admiralty. All right. The Prime Minister then was Stanley Baldwin. Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain was then, Baldwin was before? It was before that, yeah. Right, so he, there's a Chamberlain that makes him the uh, First Order of the Admiralty? Yes. Okay, and at what point does a Chamberlain have to step down? 
Chamberlain steps down on the 10th of May 1940 as a result of the catastrophic Norway, deba uh, Norway campaign, which was debated in Parliament on the 7th and the 8th, and then, um, and then on the 10th he, uh, he was forced to resign, which turns out to be the exact same day that Adolf Hitler unleashed Blitzkrieg on the West. Um, it was one of the great coincidences of, uh, of history. So he becomes, so when uh, Neville Chamberlain steps down, Churchill is selected as prime minister. That That's right, right yes, um, uh, on the same day that Hitler's attacked. So at that, he's that, what age is he at that point? 65. So he finally becomes prime minister at 65. Yeah. And uh, his main mission then is to win the war, but he needs to get the Americans in, is that right? Um, yes, of course. It was um, uh, the, the, after the Russians. Um, the key thing, uh, and one of the most important statistics of the Second World War, is that for every five Germans killed in combat, um, four of them died on the Eastern Front. So the thing that really um, bled the German army um, dry was the war on the Eastern Front against the USSR. But the, way in, the only way that we could then uh, deliver a knockout blow in the West was to have the United States on board. So he spends time going over to visit Churchill, and does Churchill enjoy meeting with him, or is Churchill uh, more, too much of a supplicant for, for Roosevelt? Um, he f he um, flew over and took, the, um, took a, a ship over the Atlantic six times in the uh, course of the war in order to meet Roosevelt. And then they also met, of course, at Tehran and Yalta, um, as well. And um, no, he certainly was not a supplicant. He, uh, he was trying to persuade Roosevelt to fight a Mediterranean strategy and, um, and actually did sell him the, the British strategy for the war. But until Pearl Harbor, uh, Roosevelt was not prepared, as I understand it, to put any troops in. Is that right? That's right, yes. No, of course, when um, the, um, until the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt could give uh, moral support at the beginning when they met in, in uh, August 1941 um, in Placentia Bay. And they also, uh, he also, at the Lend-Lease of March and April 1941, gave a tremendous um, financial support to Britain. So it is said that uh, Churchill came over and stayed at the White House sometimes for a week or 10 days or so, and that Mrs. Roosevelt got tired of him hanging around there and walking around without any clothing on, or is that true? Um, <laughs> it, well, it was more than like three weeks that he stayed in the, uh, um, in the White House. And um, he was walking around without any clothing on in his own bathroom, which I think is probably perfectly acceptable. Um, he, wasn't, uh, um, he wasn't walking around the whole of the White House. And certainly Eleanor Roosevelt never saw him déshabillé. So it, I thought they said that she got so tired of Churchill being in the White House that they set aside to buy Blair House. That's not true? No, that's not true. And, um, and he also, she, um, uh, she, she got on with him all right, but what she didn't like was the way that he would keep her husband up until 3 o'clock in the morning talking strategy and drinking cocktails. Now, speaking of that, Churchill was thought to be a very good drinker, and that is to say he, <laughs> he would drink a lot and didn't get completely drunk. Is that true? Yes, that is very true. And uh, uh, in fact, when I mentioned um, FDR's cocktails, he, he couldn't stand FDR's cocktails. That was the one thing that he, that he didn't um, drink, but he drank pretty much everything else. A normal lunch would consist, during the Second World War, would consist of a glass or two of champagne uh, before lunch, and then a glass or two of white wine with the first course, and a glass or two of red wine with the second course, and then a glass or two of brandy. Um, and dinner would be almost exactly the same. And he'd also drink um, whiskey and soda from about six o'clock in the evening all the way through to three o'clock in the morning. And he would not get drunk. He had this incredible capacity for alcohol, which is um, a second to none in, uh, in anyone that I've I, I ever written about or thought of. On one occasion in the 2,194 days of the Second World War, Churchill did get drunk. And in everybody's diary, they say that the meeting, which went on till 3 a.m., uh, he was clearly drunk. And what they decided to do was to hold the same meeting the next morning as though the other one hadn't happened. Now, he was also a big cigar smoker as well? 160,000 cigars, it's estimated, that he smoked in the course of his uh, life. Like on a typical yes. day, he would smoke... He'd, he'd just keep them lit the entire, the entire day. They'd keep going out, 
actually. They kept out going out a lot. He didn't uh, inhale. He was um, he would he would gesticulate with his cigar. He'd light it. He'd put it in his mouth. He'd suck it a bit, um, and then it would go out. And then he'd relight it. It was a it was a prop as much as um, as, as so much as so, anything to um, do with tobacco. Now he made a number of famous speeches when he was prime minister. <coughs> um, speeches talking about that they will the British will never give up or the spend the time on the beaches and defend uh, England and so forth. Were those written by him? Did he have speechwriters that write those brilliant speeches? He never employed a speechwriter in his whole life, not one. Um, he never employed a spin doctor. He had nothing like that at all. It was uh, entirely came from his own, um, his own brain. And so uh, he would write it. Now, he, when as a youth, he had a lisp. But did he ultimately kind of get out of that? Or yes, he managed to master that by the time he was um, in his late teens. And so um, he had to. Can, can I just say? Um, I think the audience would be interested about his techniques, his yes. speaking techniques, okay. because he was asked by his private secretary what were the tricks of the trade, what were the special things that he had um, mastered in order to make these incredible morale-boosting speeches in 1940 and 1941, and he said that there were really three things. The first was that you keep your sentences short. Each sentence should convey one thought and one thought only. So don't bog them down with uh, um, subclauses. And then keep your word short. Don't use long words to show off how clever you are. Just choose the right word. And if possible, also make that word Anglo coming from the Anglo-Saxon or the Old English, because uh, that way the English-speaking peoples who've used these words for a thousand years would understand what they were, what he was talking about. And when you mentioned the "We shall fight on the beaches" speech of the 4th of June 1940, where he was telling the British people what they were going to do when the Germans landed. Of the, in that last paragraph about we shall fight with overgrowing confidence in the air, ending with the phrase, uh, we shall never surrender. When you look at the 141 words of that paragraph, all but two of them come from Old English. The only two exceptions being uh, the word confidence, which comes from the Latin, and surrender, which comes from the French. But did he think at... <laughs> Did he think that, that privately that he was likely to be uh, captured at some point and maybe he tried as a war criminal himself? Yes, like, yes. He was, um, at one point he did uh, say, you know, if this goes wrong, we're going to be uh, put up against the wall and shot, which is why he made sure that he had a gun close to him at all times, a, a, a revolver. He also had a machine gun in his car. Every time he crossed the Atlantic, he made sure that there was a Bren machine gun so that if his ship was sunk by a U-boat, he would be able to fire at the U-boat. Um, so he was very conscious of this. He, he, he travelled 110,000 miles during the Second World War and very often within radius of the Luftwaffe. And he was, um, he was very conscious of the, uh, of the dangers involved. Now, he ran the war day to day from a bunker that was how deep in underground? It's about um, 30 or 40, maybe 50 feet underground. Yeah. And it was in, in not vulnerable to bombing attacks, in other words... Well, it never got a direct hit, so we don't know. Um, but uh, it, it, it's pretty sturdy when you go down there, yeah. But when Britain was being bombed, he would tend to go out and, and observe what was happening? He wasn't hiding in the suburbs or no, something? No, well, this is the thing. He, um, and, this, and it drove his bodyguard um, wild. And, uh, and indeed, his wife and the king were very worried about the way that he used to go up onto the air ministry roof to watch the bombing, to watch the blitz going on as it was happening. He'd put on his tin helmet and, and go up onto the roof, which is an extremely dangerous thing to do when your city's being bombed. So was, how involved was he in the planning of D-Day? And was he involved in helping Roosevelt select uh, uh, Eisenhower as the um, Supreme Allied Commander? Um, uh, Churchill originally wanted Alan Brooke to be the Supreme Allied Commander. Then Roosevelt wanted General Marshall. And so um, Eisenhower, uh, who Churchill fully approved of, um, wound up being the, um, being the third choice, as it were. But in a way, of course, with the Americans producing some 70% of the men and material for D-Day, it was ultimately going to be an American choice. And when it was clear that it was likely the Allies were going to win, there were some meetings, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Um, what did Churchill think of Stalin? Well, this is one of the problems um, for a biographer, in that he actually quite liked him. 
even though he knew that Stalin was an appalling mass murderer and had been responsible for the massacre of the Polish officers in the Katyn forest, some 22,000 of them. Nonetheless, he was able to get on with uh, Stalin and they stayed up um, drinking in the Kremlin till three o'clock in the morning on one occasion and that seems to have been the thing that, that bonded the two men. And um, he had a, a, a fairly good working relationship with him. Now, at Yalta, it is often said in the United States that uh, Roosevelt was maybe not physically and mentally as strong as he should have been. Um, did Churchill have that perception as well? Yes, he did, and he writes in his uh, memoirs about how frail the, uh, the president was looking. Okay, so uh, ultimately the war is won, and um, so the British people, to thank Churchill, re-elect him as prime minister? <laughs> I love the way he asks questions knowing perfectly well what the answer <laughs> is, uh, sort of slightly pretending not to know what the answer <laughs> is, with that big sort of question mark, the voice going up at the end of the sentence. No, as you know as well as I do, David, uh, he was chucked out of uh, How of could that office. happen? How could they do well, that? It's a series of things, really. Firstly, his name was only one on the 600 um, or so, 650 ballot papers. And although he, of course, won his own constituency, people wanted to punish the Conservative Party for the policy of appeasement before the Second World War. And they also wanted all the sort of good things that they thought were, thought were going to be free and, th and thought that they had fought for, like uh, nationalisation of the Bank of England and uh, the welfare state and so on. And so he lost this catastrophic catastrophically lost, the, uh, one of the great landslide defeats of the uh, 20th century. And when his wife, Clementine, came to him during the actual results, as the results were coming in and it was clear what was going on, and said that it was a blessing, probably a blessing in disguise. And Churchill said, well, from where I'm sitting, it seems quite remarkably well disguised. So uh, he did not expect to lose, is that correct? No, he expected so to. So he, when you, he loses in that case, he becomes a leader of the opposition. So was he very involved as the leader of the opposition, spending a lot of time in Parliament? Doing no, no, he, he wasn't. He, um, the, the Labour Party had a huge majority. He knew that however well he did, he wasn't going to be able to um, overthrow that until the next election. And so, and he was also exhausted, you know. He had been fighting every day for six uh, years. He was incredibly tired by the end of the um, uh, war and so he went on holiday a lot, he painted a lot, he went down to uh, Morocco, to Marrakesh to uh, revive himself and so he was ready by 1950, he was absolutely ready to, uh, to take on the Labour Party again. But let me make sure I understand, we see on television here that C-SPAN, the British Parliament having its debates in the, in the House of Commons, the leader of the opposition, the Prime Minister, was he just not standing up and having those debates? He had no, somebody else do that? No, sorry, he was there all the time for all, for all the debates. He just wasn't um, exerting himself in the same way that he'd exerted himself during the war. Okay. And you mentioned painting. Uh, he wrote a book about the uh, pleasure of painting. And yes. um, was he a really good painter? I think he was, but I'm no art um, connoisseur. I, uh, I would bow to others in that judgment. But several other people, especially those people who helped teach him uh, painting, um, did think he was very Thank good. And, he, and I tell you, also, he put forward his paintings to the um, annual exhibition of the Royal Academy um, under different names, under assumed names, and, um, and very often won prizes for them. So um, when he was a leader of the opposition, he was invited to make a speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. And you and I were out there not long ago. Yes. And uh, was, is, uh, what did he say in that speech, and why did it get so much attention? Yes, it was a speech on the 5th of March 1946 in Fulton, Missouri, and known, of course, as the Iron Curtain speech, because he warned the United States and Britain and the West um, about the real nature, the true nature of Stalin and Soviet communism and the imperialism that they were responsible for in the eastern part of Europe. And it was a tremendously unpopular speech, and he was uh, attacked in the press and, and in Congress and in Parliament. And only uh, after that, that moment in March 1946 was he slowly but surely proved right in everything that he had uh, predicted. So eventually, um, his party gets back in power. 
And so he becomes prime minister again at what age? At um, 80, uh, uh, 77, 77. 77, yes. Well, there you are. He, I told you he knew all the answers to the questions. Yeah. He, at 77, it's, it's, he's 81 by the time he leaves right. um, office. Okay, so when he's prime minister at 77, is his health that good? Um, no, he's gone a bit deaf by now. He's, uh, he's uh, put on a lot of weight. Um, and uh, within a year, sorry, two years of becoming prime minister, a little over two years later, he has a stroke, quite a debilitating stroke, where he had to go to Chartwell, his house, uh, in, um, in Kent, and stay there for four months. Did people know that he had a stroke? No, they managed to keep it uh, completely secret. Um, some of his best friends, Lord Camrose, who owned the Daily Telegraph, Lord Beaverbrook, who owned the Evening Standard, um, the people also who owned the Sunday Times and uh, various other newspapers, um, Brendan Bracken, his closest friend, who uh, owned the Financial Times, they all got together and decided to keep it out of the press. So, um... So the government was run by his son-in-law, uh, by the cabinet secretary, and by one of his private secretaries, none of whom were elected. Okay, so when does he decide to step down as prime minister? April 1955. And he's then 81 years yes, old. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So when he Wait. steps down, um, what does he decide to do? Uh, write books, go back to writing books. And um, he uh, had been writing the history of the Second World War during his um, time as uh, leader of the opposition. And, um, and so now he wrote the English speaking, history of the English speaking peoples and, and now, other he, he was awarded in, I think, 1953 the Nobel Prize for Literature, but why not Nobel Prize for Peace? Did he want the peace one or the literature one or what? He wanted the, um, the, the peace one. And in fact, he must be the only person in the world who's slightly disappointed when they get the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> okay. So um, in his later years, he comes to the United States from time to time? A, a lot, yes, exactly. And uh, he loved America. He came here 14 times, which in those days when you had to come by, by ship was more uh, uh, onerous, of course, than it is today. He uh, was very friendly with people like George Marshall and, uh, and Eisenhower and others. So, yes, he, he, he loved coming here. But he, did he ever meet President Kennedy while President Kennedy was president? Um, no, not whilst he was president. He'd met him many years earlier. He'd met him when he was the son of the American ambassador. Okay, so uh, today uh, you would say Churchill's greatest legacy is what? Oh golly, there are so many. Um, I think his fierce um, denunciation of totalitarianism and fascism, of course, has to stand head and shoulders uh, above all the others. The way in which he helped save the world from those two uh, monstrous tyrannies, the uh, the sheer, his, his literary legacy is quite extraordinary. Many of his books really do, um, do bear rereading um, to you uh, in the audience here. His, for example, My Early Life, his wonderful autobiography. I really do recommend you all to read that immediately after you've read my book. Now, he had an extraordinary relationship with his wife, Clementine, right? So he, it was a great love affair, no girlfriends, no paramours, nothing, right? It was a great love affair, no girlfriends, no paramours, no. And how many children did he have? Five, one of whom died in infancy. And so, um, are any of his children alive now? No. And he has how many grandchildren? Oh, golly. Um, how many grandchildren? Michael, um, we have the former director of the International right. Churchill Society here. How many grandchildren were there? Five or six, yes, okay. there we are. And they, Thank you. <laughs> and some of them live in the United States. Um, One of them does. Uh, he did, he, he died. Uh, no, he, no, he has his granddaughters living here. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, grand, grand, the granddaughter, right, absolutely. Right. Yes, no, Edwina, of course, right. um, lives in New York, yes, but his, his, um, his so grandchildren. So he was made an honorary citizen of the United States. I think one of the only two or three people at that time who have been made honorary citizen of the United States. I think you did it to Lafayette or somebody, right. didn't you? Yes, but uh, um, <laughs> you can imagine I don't like Lafayette terribly much. Um, but, um, but yes, and he was very proud of that, and it was okay. a wonderful thing to have done. So. Uh, for those people who are watching, and some might be watching on uh, C-SPAN, uh, why should somebody, now that you've heard everything about this book, why should somebody want to go out and buy this book? 
<laughs> um, because it's the best book on Churchill ever written. Okay, um, okay. and uh, when you finished it, did you say, thank God I'm done, or did you say, I wish I had more time to work on Churchill? I was very sad when I, uh, when I finished it because I know that uh, whatever I write about for the rest of my life is going to be, in a sense, a bit of an anticlimax after this. So month. if you had a chance to have dinner with Winston Churchill, what would be the one or two questions you'd want to ask him? I would um, right now give my little finger for the chance to have dinner with uh, Winston Churchill. I really would. If you had a portable guillotine, I'd just give it to you right now. And, uh, and what I'd ask him is, where did his sense of destiny come from? Um, and I think that would be a... And also, I'd love him, if he's able to have read all the biographies about him, I'd love him to, to comment on some of the modern ones that have been trashing him um, uh, about his grand strategy in the Second World War and so on, and, and get his take about where they go wrong and uh, what the truth was. Now, in England today, many people say, well, if Winston Churchill were alive, he would be in favour of Brexit, or he'd be against Brexit. Um, as a Churchill expert, what is your view on what he would have said about Brexit? Well, of course, he was one of the great um, founders of the European movement. And uh, so in that sense, he always wanted France and Germany to come together so there could never be another war. As he said, Teuton must never fight Gaul. Um, but he never wanted Britain to be part of the um, European Union. And so I think he'd have most definitely been in favour of Brexit. Okay, now, you've written this book about maybe the most popular British person in America. Now you're writing one about the least popular person <laughs> yes. uh, in America who's British. Uh, tell us a little bit why you're writing uh, this, this next book. I'm writing a biography of King George III, which is going to be... Uh, it's going to be... Uh, thank you. It's going to be subtitled, Last King of America. Um, and uh, he is um, not the tyrant of the Declaration of Independence, and he's certainly not the villain uh, that is shown in the Hamilton musical. Uh, he was, in fact, a, um, an enlightened figure and a Renaissance prince, but he was extremely unlucky to live in the same decade as these giants such as Washington and Franklin and Adams and Madison and Monroe and Hamilton and so on. So uh, I'm going to ask you to take another look at your last king. So um, I have read this book. I highly recommend it to people. It, if you really like Churchill or want to know more about Churchill, this is the best book I've ever read on Churchill. So thank you very much for doing it. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you.